Hey, advanced procrastinators, welcome back to another episode of Review for the AP Exam. Uh, hopefully, you guys have already read your chapter from this book, Study Guide Chapter Number Four. Okay, these are the study guide questions you should have answered before beginning the review. All right. As we do the review, there are embedded questions called checking for understanding questions, CFUs. Make sure you're answering these questions as we go through for my students that are on a Google Doc on Canvas. So find those, please. So let's begin the review. Now, uh, we are looking at the beginning of the American central government, and we we're talking about from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. So keep this in mind, given that the United States Republic created a weak central government in a effort to avoid the tyranny of the English crown, students are going to ex examine the process of how the U.S. moved from a weak central government, which was the Articles of Confederation, the first federal government of the United States, to a stronger central government, the Constitution. And this was in an effort to make a more, more perfect union of the states. <clears throat> now, in regards to having power of a new government, of a central power, not just a state power, but say Washington, D.C. today, there are three concerns over this. Number one is where should power reside? As I was just saying, should it be given to the states where the states are close to the people or a central government which can rule over everybody? Also, a bicameral, a two-house or a one-house legislature that makes the laws. Now, the reason why some people argue for a one-house legislature is it's more efficient. It's just one group of people that have to vote on things, but it can be easily manipulated by one group. Whereas a bicameral legislature, if it passes one house, it has to go to another house, and the other house might disagree with the first house. And then also, most importantly, is how is representation going to be a proportion, right? Is it going to be by population or per state? Right. A problem here is when these states go to a central government to make the laws, how many votes do I get? And a problem is larger states would have more power if it was proportional representation. So how would the smaller states have a say in this new government? Now, keep this in mind. Why are Americans in the first place, even today, suspicious of a strong central government? But in particular, in 1787, why would Americans be suspicious of a strong central government? Stop and think about that for one second. And the answer to that is, well, basically, we just had a revolutionary war. We broke away from a king and a king and a parliament that was making laws that Americans had to listen to and live by 3,000 miles away. And Americans were very suspicious of that. Next, the first government, national government of the United States was the Articles of the Confederation. Before the Constitution, there was the Articles. Now, what were some weaknesses? Well, the first one, it has a unicameral assembly. And each state only got one vote per state. And the problem with one vote per state was small states like Delaware or Rhode Island had just as many votes as large states like Virginia. It'd be the same today that Wyoming would have the exact same amount of power as California, which is a large state in the union. There is no president of the United States. So if you're ever asked who's the first president of the United States under the Articles of Confederation, it was nobody. There was no president. And the question here is, why is a president so important to have? And why did Americans not want a president? Think about that for a second. Now, the answer to that is a president, his responsibility is he is the one person who represents everybody in America. And this is supposed to be a person who thinks of what's best for the whole country, not just a small group like my state or my local uh, constituents. Also, a president can make really quick decisions in an instance when times of war or, say, right now, a pandemic. He can try to make decisions about what could be best for the country. And obviously, the reason why the Americans did not want a president is we just had a king, and that didn't go very well for us. And we had a rebellion against a king. Also, another weakness is in order to make laws, you had to have a super majority, not just a majority of 50%. So you had to have 9 out of 13 to prove, prove a new law. And if you don't like any of these laws, you have to have unanimity to amend or change any of these articles. So if you decide one day, hey, we, we need to have a president, all 13 colleges need to agree on, agree on that. Now, what's the problem with needing a supermajority to make laws rather than just a simple majority? Think about that for a second. And the problem with that is it's very hard to get a majority uh, in the first place, right? And to have a supermajority is even harder. So a small minority could stop legislation. Remember when I told you guys, it's like Friday night, you're going to go out and everyone asks, hey, where do we go for food? Let's go to In-N-Out. Almost everybody likes In-N-Out. And then one person says, no, I don't like In-N-Out. We're not going to In-N-Out. 
So there's always one person or one group that might not like that. And having a supermajority gives that small group an inordinate amount of power to stop legislation. Now, the Article of Confederation, it does not survive. Obviously, it's replaced by the Constitution. But two achievements that the Articles of Confederation did well that you do need to remember are going to be this. Number one is in the upper right-hand corner. That's the Land Ordinance of 1785. And it was designed as a way to divide land in the Ohio Valley in the Northwest Territory right, for new settlers. right, And the money raised from this would be used for education. So when Americans moved out west, there was a way that you could buy land and claim your land. Now, why was the money going to be used for education? Why was education seen as so important, especially to farmers? You don't need to be able to read to farm. Think about that. And the answer to that is a democracy needs an educated electorate. And because we're now based on a democracy, people need to be able to read and make their own decisions. So education was seen as being important, not to your career or your economic success, but to the political success of a young democracy. The other one is the Northwest Ordinance in the lower right-hand corner, you can see in orange, the Northwest Territory. And this divides a way that a new territory Territories in the West can become states. And basically, the idea was a territory would be run until, by Congress until there's number two, 5,000 settlers, and then they could form a territory. And then they could elect representatives to the legislature and have one representative to Congress. But to apply for statehood, and this is basically true even today, is it depends on the population. 60,000 settlers in this area for statehood you can apply, and this area will be divided into three to five states. Now, it was divided into five states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So those are the Northwest states. Now, why was this idea of incorporating new land in the West, into the Confederation, so important to the future of the nation? This incorporation of westward states into in westward territories into states is vital. Why? Think about that. What would happen if these western territories were not allowed to become states and join the United States? Think. And the answer to this is: remember, the thirteen states saw themselves all as independent sovereign nations that just happened to be part of a larger group. That's what a confederation is. It's a loose grouping of nations. So the United States of America aren't really united. It's states that happen to be united. And newly settled areas in the West, they could start their own country if they wanted to. I mean, there are already 13 independent countries that happen to be together. Now, you could literally go out there and start Romanca land and have no part of the United States. So in order for the United States of America to expand, you have to have a way to invite and attract these Western areas to want to stay part of the United States. Now, What's going to cause a change where Americans recognize one day, hey, we got a problem here with the Articles of Confederation, and we need to have a stronger central government to enforce the law? And that's going to be Shays' Rebellion in the West. Now, Shays' Rebellion is in Massachusetts, and what happens here is in Western Massachusetts, farmers go into debt because of the Revolutionary War, and they ask the government to protect their property. And the state government of Massachusetts says, no, we can't protect your property. You borrowed against your land, and the banks are going to take your property. Well, uh, the farmers, basically, when they got mad, they said, hey, we're going to burn stuff. We want our land protected, right? So what ends up happening is the farmers take over the courthouse. The farmers are then chased down by the militia, right? And the, and, and the Shayas are either arrested or they escape to another state and say, hey, you can't touch me. I'm now in another state, which is essentially another country. So what Shays Rebellion proved is you need to have a strong central government that can enforce the law. Every time Americans get angry, you can't say, hey, let's go burn something, right? The elite, the rich in America was afraid that the civil disobedience of burning stuff, threatening plantations, homes, and wealth could spread around America. Now, where on earth do people get this idea that when government's not doing its job, we can rise up and burn stuff? Because think, what's the role of government for Americans back then? And this idea of people rising up and saying, hey, I'm angry at the government comes from natural rights, life, liberty, and property. The purpose of government is to protect your rights. And in this case, it would be property. So the farmers are just saying, hey, look, we need the government to protect our property, even though it was the farmer's fault for borrowing against their land and they couldn't pay back their debts. 
So you needed a government that could be more effective in order to fulfill its duties. So what you get now is the Constitutional Convention in the upper left-hand corner, where 55 delegates get together in Massachusetts from various states to decide how can we fix the Articles of Confederation. So what they come up with are two plans dealing with representation, the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. Now, the Virginia plan, which is proposed by James Madison, who's known as the father of the Constitution, this becomes the basis of the Constitution, essentially. It has a bicameral legislature, two houses in Congress, an executive branch of president, and in this case, the Virginia plan, representation will be based on population. That's the large state plan, so you can see in the map on the upper right, let's say Virginia gets seven, six votes, and New Jersey only gets two votes based on population. New Jersey plan, their plan is they're thinking, look, why do we want to become part of this if we only get two votes to Virginia's six votes? We want equal representation, a portion representation per state. Now, here's the thing. Why is this issue of representation so sensitive to the states? And the reason for the answer here is this. Remember, as I said, each state was a sovereign nation. They're independent. And what they're basically doing is giving up their independence to be part of a larger government that's going to impose laws on every single state equally. So the smaller states or every state wants to make sure that they have a say in the new central government. Because what's the purpose of joining this strong central government if every other state is going to tell us what to do? I, as a smaller state, want to have a say on that. Now, the solution to this is going to be the Great Compromise. And in the Great Compromise, you're going to have a two-house Congress, as you can see in the upper right, that's the Capitol building. And on one side of, on one wing is the Senate and one wing is the House of Representatives. So you have the House of Representatives, that's based on population. This favors the larger states. And then on the other side, you have the Senate, which is equal representation, which is basically the New Jersey plan there, which is two senators per state, right? And both the Senate, the House, and the President all have to approve new laws. Now, in the legislative branch, which is basically what the Great Compromise is, it's the two houses, right? The House of Representatives and the Senate. And the powers that are delegated to this legislative branch are, yes, they make the laws. Everyone says they make the laws. Okay, yeah, that, that's that's fine. But the president can have a say in making the laws too. But the real power that, that, that the Congress also has, or legislative branch, is number one, money. Congress controls how money is spent. The annual budget of the United States is about nine, ten trillion dollars a year. And it's Congress, not the president, that decides how to dole out that money. Also, in regards to going to the war, it is Congress that declares war and allows the country to go to war. So who's the executive branch and what is the power of the executive branch? Well, the president is the head of the executive branch and he enforces the laws. That's what everyone always says. But he can also propose laws for Congress as well, too. And a lot of times a day, presidents are seen as the leaders of their political party and they have an idea and they can push that through Congress. But other real powers that the executive branch has is number one, they have veto power. If Congress makes a law that the president doesn't like, so in the Congress, if it's a Republican president and Democrats make a law that the Republican president doesn't like, the Republican president can shut that law down and say, go back and do it again, or that law is never going to get past my desk. Also, the president is the head of the military. Okay. So he's the commander in chief and he runs the military. Now, based on seven and eight, at this time, which branch had more power then, the legislative branch or the executive branch? Stop and think. And the answer here is today, a lot of people would argue that the president, the executive branch is gaining more and more and more power because a lot of times the executive branch can propose to Congress what, what he wants his political party to do in Congress. But back then, the idea is the legislative branch was given the majority of the power. Obviously, Americans are afraid of having a king, so they wanted to limit the power of the president. But basically, I mean, a simple one is they control the money. The legislative branch controls the money. It's very much like you guys as a teenager, right, where you can kind of – your parents put down rules on you and stuff like that, but you can ignore those rules a lot of times. But then you tell mom and dad, hey, mom, dad, can I borrow the car? Yeah, they have the keys. That's basically like declaring war. The president might be in charge of the military, which is the car. Right. But in order to drive the car, he needs the keys. Oh, and also, by the way, mom and dad, can I borrow 20 bucks for gas? Congress controls the money. 
Okay, so with the money, Congress has a lot of control over the President of the United States. Now, after this great compromise is proposed, the Constitution now goes to the states to ratify and agree to join this new form of government. So when the Constitution is sent to the states, it's now up to the states to decide, do we want to join this this new constitution and give up our power or do we want to stay an independent sovereign nation so you have the federalist you have the federalist and the anti-federalist are two groups of people in each state that are for or against the constitution now the federalists they support the constitution as is they say we we've written up it's perfect and what we've done is we've put in checks and balances we've separated powers like the president he's in control of the military but he can't go to war without congress so there's ways to prevent this government from becoming tyrannical so the pre- the federalists say it works the anti-federalists are people who are afraid of a strong central government remember we just fought a revolutionary war against a king and now what we're doing is we're basically making a government that's now going to have a king right so what the anti-federalists want and I've not mentioned this yet is a bill of rights that protects individuals from bad government that's what the anti-Federalists want added into it. Now, there's a series of essays called The Federalists, written by and among James Madison, Noggs, and Hamilton, uh, arguing why the Constitution is going to work. And probably the most famous one you want to remember is Federalist Number 10. Because the idea at this time was that a problem with the United States is going to be it's too diverse to survive. Small countries work better. Germany works because the only people who live in Germany are Germans. And France works because the only people that work in France is France. You're taking 13 countries and you're putting them together. And people say that's a problem because the country's too big and it's too diverse. And in Federalist number 10, he says it says basically that larger publics work with diverse groups, which leads to America's strength today. Because in a diverse country, one group cannot take over when there's lots of different interests. And the idea here is who controls America today? And a lot of people say, well, white people do. But no, wait. White people, even in America, are a diverse group of people. Californians and New Yorkers and Alabamans, right, and cowboys and capitalists, they're all different people. So in America today, there's really not one group of people that controls the country. Now, some basic aspects of the Constitution, of how it's written up, we have bicameralism, so you know what this is, right? It's a two-house legislature, and the rules that are in place to prevent the president or a group of taking over control of our government is called um, checks and balances. We have separation power. You can see right there on the right, three branches of government. Um, and this is the answer to letter J, checks and balances. It prevents one part of the government from taking too much power. And the executive, the legislative, and I've not mentioned the, the judicial branch, they all have a responsibility as far as interpreting and delegating powers in the Constitution. Also, at the same time, keep this in mind the idea of federalism. Not all power is given to the central government. Power is divided between the states and the the, the federal government. Anything not given to the basically to the federal government is given to the states. That's the Tenth Amendment, right? It's known as the States' Rights Amendment. The Constitution does not answer everything, and it actually the Tenth Amendment gives states inordinate amounts of power. In fact, right now with this COVID nineteen crisis, we have a couple of days ago, the states are trying to each state is deciding what they want to do with their state if they're going to have it open or closed and whatnot. It's not the federal government's matter to do that because the states are like, look, we know what's best for our state at this time. And that's the 10th Amendment that gives them the power. All right. Thank you very much for listening, guys. And with that, have a good day.